Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting at verse 2. Look here at what the Lord says. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. How many of you feel like you're in a wilderness right now? I was talking to a pastor just this past week, and he was saying how it just the ministry and the church and everything happening to him personally and happening in the church, it's just so strange and surreal, and he doesn't know what the Lord is doing, and he doesn't understand where everything is headed. He's at peace, but uh, that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of pain. It's a place of suffering. It's a place where you feel confused and disoriented, and you don't really know what's going on, and you don't really know what direction the Lord wants you to take, and uh, you're kind of out there, and you feel kind of lost. Any of you feel like that sometimes? Many times you don't understand what the trial means or when the trial is going to end or what's going on. and So the wilderness is, is kind of that place of suffering and confusion and kind of wondering what's up. And God led them through the wilderness for 40 years. It took 40 years for all of the carnality to die. And many times God takes us in seasons of our life out into the wilderness and he just waits for all the carnality in us to die. And uh, we need to give heed. He says, you shall remember everything you learned out there in the wilderness. So when you go through those seasons of pain and suffering and failure and sin, and make sure you remember those things and don't ever forget what God delivered you from. Don't ever forget how evil and wicked and deceitful sin is. Don't ever forget how good God is to forgive you. Don't ever forget how gracious he is to deliver you and set you free from the bondage. You shall remember all that way for all of those years. Remember the wilderness. And I don't think the wilderness is a one-time event in the Christian's life. I think we kind of go in and out of the wilderness through our whole experience here and journey through the earth. Remember where God has brought you from and don't ever forget the principles that you learned. He took you to the wilderness, number one, to humble you. To humble you. Nothing like being put under pressure, the stress of the wilderness. It, it shows all of your faults and weaknesses and failures, and it becomes very clear, you know. When everything is going right and you're having nothing but success after success, it's hard to see all the cracks and the weaknesses and the fra uh, frailties. But when you're under the pressure of the trial, those things all come to the surface, don't they? And so he took you out there in this trial, in this wilderness, to humble you, to teach you how much you need him, and to teach you how much you depend upon his cleansing and his strengthening and his help in your life, to teach you that you can't make it on your own. He took you out there to humble you. He took you out there to test you, to know what was in your heart. You know, loyalty and faithfulness, they're tested in the bad times, not the good times. The marriage vows, you know, the old marriage vows, till death do us part, for better and for worse. One thing I've never understood is how when some couples go through tragedies, you know, like maybe their child dies in an accident or they have some other tragedy in the family, and they end up getting a divorce. I've never understood that. I mean, when you, when you suffer with someone, that develops such a bond of intimacy. I mean, that person has your back. That person is there for you. They're committed to you for better or for worse in the good times and the bad times. That's when you find someone that you can really trust with your life. And so God takes us out many times to test our obedience, to see whether or not we would keep his commandments, because obedience is really tested when it costs you something, when it's going to be a sacrifice, when it's going to hurt to obey, when you're going to have to go against everything in your flesh and intellect and everything against the world to obey, that's when true obedience is tested and tried and proven. And so it's in those times of trial when he's testing us that we become very intimate and very close to the Lord and 
we see our own frailties and we know how much we need him. And he says he takes you out there for these purposes. He humbled you and he lets you be hungry. You know, God will take you out to the wilderness and he'll let you suffer. God does let bad things happen to our life. But the blessings of what he's working through those bad times is so much greater than the pain that you'll look at the trial afterwards and say, thank God, it's been, it was good for me to be afflicted. I'm glad for what God worked in my life. The situation was terrible. The situation was evil. But what God worked in my heart through it was eternal and so good that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. The bread that keeps your body alive cannot give you hope and joy and strength and courage. That comes by the mouth of the Lord. And you learn very quickly, I can't just learn, I can't just live by natural means, by my own strength and by my own efforts and ingenuity. I need a strength that's greater than my own. That's what the wilderness teaches you. I need to cry out to God. I need to live by everything that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. Because this loaf of bread isn't getting it. This doesn't give me what I need to make it in life. And so God takes you out into the wilderness to teach you those things, and you begin to learn how to live by the strength of the word of God. You begin to learn how to live by the power of God. And so the, the, uh, the wilderness can be a wonderful place, especially in hindsight. It's not so great when you're there in real time, but in hindsight, you're so thankful, and God says to be very careful to never forget what you learned out there. Your clothing did not wear out on you nor did your foot swell these 40 years. As I look back through different seasons of my life and trials that I've been through and failures that I've been through and how difficult those times were, but I, you realize God never left me. My foot never swelled. My shoes, my boots never wore out. There was a supernatural sustenance. God is there with you in the wilderness. He never forsakes you. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man discipline his, disciplines his son. We need to submit to the discipline of our God. No, no, there's not one of us that's above discipline. It's not a thing of, well, I've grown up now and I'm mature and I don't need spankings anymore. No, we're, you're disciplined until the day you go home to heaven. There are things in us that are constantly needing to be changed and purged and matured. And so thank God for these times in our life. I put there, and the main thing we want to focus on is this principle. When you're in the middle of a trial or when you're in the wilderness, seek God. Don't just seek a quick fix to the circumstances. Seek God. Because a lot of times we come under, under the pressure and the pain, and our uh, initial reaction is, God, get me out. This hurts. I don't like it. Please just change this circumstance, God but we're really not seeking his heart and seeking his mind. And David expresses this wonderfully in Psalms 27. And I want you to see the distinction here that David makes when he was in a time of great trial. A Psalm of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and they fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. What courage, what confidence, what peace. If you walk out of your front door this morning and you have this whole army uh, under, under siege, you... They're, uh, they're surrounding your home. They're about to destroy you. Your heart would probably tremble a little bit. But look at what David says here. As he's trying to run from Saul and he's, he's escaping so many perils, he says, even then, when a host encamps me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be what? Confident. Now, where does David get this confidence? He gets it in verse 4. One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek. How many things? One thing. And that one thing that he asked, 
He's not asking for his enemies to be annihilated. Do you see that there? Even though a host is encamped against him, what is he going to do? What is his reaction? What is his heart? His heart is one thing that I've asked, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. And so the lesson in this is when the enemy is encamped against you and the trial and the suffering comes to your door, don't just go to God and say, God, get me out of this, get me out of this, get me out of this. Run to God and truly seek his heart. There's a big difference. And say, Father, I just want to get as close to you as I possibly can. I want to see your beauty. I want to hear your wisdom. I want to meditate on you. One thing have I asked. Don't you think David could have asked for two or three things? Like, take this enemy out, push these back, give me success, make me prosperous, give me victory, Lord. But what was the cry of David's heart? Father, let me just know you. And that's, that's the thing that we have to come to when we come under pressure and when we come under trial. And when you seek God first, instead of just seeking the solution, you will have this type of a confidence. Look at verse 5. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. See, it didn't say that his enemies would be gone. He's still surrounded by enemies, but now his head is lifted up. I think we're talking about the difference of when you're in a trial, does God take you out of the trial or does he take you through the trial? And there's times when he's going to take you through the trial. And it's going to be hurtful and you're going to be scared and you're going to go through a certain element of suffering. But the rewards, the blessings of what he wants to do as you go through rather than taking you out is so great. And David here has experienced that when he says, my head is lifted up above my enemies. They're surrounding me. They could, they could take my life at any moment. But I have such peace and joy in the presence of the Lord. That's where God wants us to be. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Verse 7, David says, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, be gracious to me and answer me. And God does not respond and say, okay, David, well, give me an itemized list. Which enemy do you want me to take out first? How does God respond? When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do you see the difference? There's a difference between coming to God and just trying to find a quick fix to your problems there's a difference between that and then coming to really seek his heart and seek his face and be with him. And if you set your heart to seek him, his presence will be a mighty fortress around you. His spirit will be your refuge. And even though you're surrounded by enemies, your head will be lifted up above your enemies. And in spite of the pain and in spite of the turmoil, you'll have that peace and joy of the Lord. And when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. When Terry was in the hospital and, you know, she had the, the broken rib, and that was when the coughing was the worst, you know, and I mean, for her to just move slightly hurt because of the broken rib. And if you can imagine, when she, whenever she would cough, it just felt like she was breaking the bone all over again. It was excruciating. Until they came with that little syringe of Denladen. And uh, Denladen made all the difference in the world. And after that, went into her IV and uh, circulated a little bit. You, she was a changed person. I mean, her, her face relaxed, her body relaxed. She could cough and move a little bit and take care of things without without uh, groaning and, and in pain. And you know, the Lord is your delighted without any of the bad side effects. 
You know, painkillers have a lot of bad side effects. And I'm not in any way praising the virtues of narcotics, so don't get me wrong. But I'm just using it as a human example of, you know, the painkiller can lift you up and out of the pain, and that's what the Lord does. The problem is still there. The broken rib was still there. The pneumonia was still there. But there was a peace. And she could do what she needed to do. And that's what happens with the Lord. The Lord has this wonderful way when you just set your heart to seek his face instead of just seeking the quick fix, he will lift your head up above your enemies. And the enemies aren't gone, but you don't care anymore because you're just so encompassed with God's love and protection and mercy and grace. Let them do what they're going to do. I'm, I'm good. That's what God's presence will do. And so... When you're in times and, and we pray, but the answer doesn't come the way we think it will come or the way we want it to come many times, and the problem continues, and it becomes evident that God's not taking you out, he's taking you through, your hiding place, your refuge, is the presence of God. Your peace is in the, is in the presence of God. And so get as close to his heart as you can and just seek his face, seek his wisdom, Seek his heart. God, I just want to be here with you. I'm not going to go anywhere else, Father. I'm just, I'm just going to curl up in your arms, get as close to your heartbeat as I can. I'm just going to stay here with you for a while. And his presence becomes that fortress that surrounds you and protects you. And you have courage, and you're no longer afraid for the mob that's surrounding you. But you have peace in spite of the storm. I love this here in Psalms 23, 5. God loves to work this way. You prepare a table before me where? In the presence of my enemies. Well, Lord, can I pick another table, please? Somewhere maybe over there where my enemies aren't. But a lot of times God likes to show off his power by preparing the table right there in their face to let them see how he protects you to let them see his banner over you of love, to let them see that you are his child and they can't touch you without going through him first. And so many times God will leave you in the presence of your enemies. He won't take the problem away. But he's doing so to supernaturally sustain you and deliver you in the midst of, to get the greater glory. I want you to see here, seeking a quick fix instead of seeking God first can many times lead you out of God's will. And you don't want to be out of God's will. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And so he took with him Peter and James and John and they began to be grieved and distressed and he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved, even to the point of death. And Jesus was not prone to exaggerate. You know how we say sometimes, oh, I'm so hungry I could die. And death is like the furthest thing away. Uh, when he said, I could die, Jesus meant it. And his soul was just so deeply broken and grieved. My soul is grieved, even to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. So I want you to see here, when you're in the middle of a trial or pain or suffering, some problem, it, it, there's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, please take this from me. Jesus prayed that way. The apostle Paul prayed that way. But, you know, I think one of the great dilemmas for Christians is those times when God does not answer that prayer but leaves you in the midst and you've got to go through. And here Jesus had to go through. There's no getting out of this one. And I just want to show you to, to caution your own heart to know, you know, sometimes if I'm just praying to get out, what I'm actually getting out of is God's will. And the immediate problem may be gone. But wouldn't you much rather be in the center of God's will in pain 
than outside of God's will and feel good? What means more to you? See, this is why he says, I took you out there to the wilderness to prove you. You know, if the pain, if the suffering causes you to turn away from God, then maybe you didn't love him the way you thought you did. Do you want to be with him so much and his will so much that you will endure the pain just to be with him? So Jesus was in this dilemma and he says, Father, if, it, if there's any way you can take it from me, but for this cup to pass from Jesus, the whole plan of salvation would have failed. For Jesus to suffer was the will of God. You know the story. He goes through and prays this three times. The wrestle. Even Jesus wrestled with this in his heart. Paul wrestled with it. Remember back in Daniel chapter 3, verse 25? Nebuchadnezzar erects a statue of himself, narcissistic to the max. When, the, when, the, when you hear the trumpet blows, I want everybody to bow down and worship my... Uh, statue because I'm so great and worthy of all the worship and there were three guys that refused to do it Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego remember the story and so Nebuchadnezzar gets enraged I mean he is really mad and he calls them to heat up the furnace even hotter than uh, what they usually do and they throw these three guys in and what happens there's no shrieking, there's no cries, there's no pain, there's no suffering. The, he looks in and he sees four guys in there. Now, if we would pray in this case, in this instance, and say, Father, get me out of the furnace. Getting you out of the furnace, you would have missed the fourth man. Do you really want to miss the fourth man? I don't think so. Do you really want to be out of the will of God? If God's will is for you to go through. And so Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and he says, look, I see four men loosed, walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. I thought there were just three. Where did this fourth guy come from? The fourth guy has the appearance of the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of the blazing fire and he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out your servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they just come walking out of the fire. That'd freak some people out, wouldn't it? Because look at what happens. It said the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Their hair wasn't singed. Their trousers weren't damaged. They didn't even have the smell of smoke or fire upon them. What a great victory was wrought in going through instead of getting out. And this type of victory is what God wants to work in your life and my life time and time again. And I know we hate the thought of going through. We would rather come out. But going through many times is the center of God's will. And when you're in the center of God's will, just look how he can protect you and preserve you and strengthen you in wonderful ways. Seeking a quick fix instead of seeking God first can forfeit the greater good and the greater miracle. Remember when Jesus was arrested, Matthew chapter 26, verse 47, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you have come for. So they laid hands on Jesus. They seized him. One of those that, who we know to be Peter struck uh, the slave of the high priest, cut off his ear, struck him with a sword, Jesus said, put your sword back. Those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. And then look at verse 53. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put all my disposal 
put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Now do the math for a moment. Jesus calls 12 legions of angels. That would have been pretty spectacular, right? I mean, that would have proven something. But it would have only proven something to those men that were there. To call 12 legions of angels would have only saved one life. By going to the cross, Jesus saved the life of every man, woman, and child ever to be born. What was the greater good here? You know, I think of Cheryl and everything Cheryl's been through physically. And many others as well, but... I mean, that, the, the Sullivan family has a legacy. They have a heritage of miraculous power of the sustaining of God, the uh, preservation of life. And I mean, those, those kids will never forget what you've been through, Cheryl. And it would have been much better for you, uh, you know, in the temporal to be out, but God took you through. And your kids cannot deny what God did in your life in that time. And so when you weigh things like the greater good, and is this just going to make me feel better now? Or will the way God sustains me by His grace be a testimony for others? How many times do we suffer for the sake of others? And we think, God, I didn't ask for this. Why is this coming on me? And because he wants to display his preservation. He wants to display his grace, his keeping power through you so that others can learn, so that others can be encouraged, so that others will know God is at work. God is alive. He's real. He's powerful. And so taking the 12 legions of angels would really been a cheap cop-out. Would have saved his life, but you and I would be in a whole mess of trouble, wouldn't we? because he would have never gone to the cross. And so many times, it's what is the greater good? What is the greater miracle in all of this? I put there in your notes, seeking a quick fix instead of seeking God first forfeits a deeper intimacy and union with God. You know, we've talked so many times about how bad times drive us to our knees. Suffering drives us to the throne of God. Psalms 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? You are with me. And when you have to travel through that valley, you know his presence in a very real way that you can't know any other way. And you are aware of his presence because you depend upon his presence for your next breath, for your next heartbeat. You would be devastated by the sorrow and the pain if you didn't know the comfort of him being with you. And so you draw close to him in such precious times. You know, it, what, what uh, unbreakable bonds exist between people who have suffered a tragedy together. And that is what forms between you and the Lord. Where he touches and reaches into the deep places of your heart that no human can ever touch. And he can show you his companionship and his care and his love for you like no person ever could. And he touches you in the deepest places of your pain and sorrow. And he girds you and he strengthens you and he encourages you. And instead of committing suicide, You wake up morning after morning with joy and peace in your heart, with his praises in your mouth, because he is with you. And no matter what you go through, he is the deciding factor. He makes all of the difference in the world. God is with me. I don't have to fear. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul used this expression, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And we go, oh, I'll go, yay, I want to know the power and the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, can I get out of that one? I'll take the power of his resurrection, but I'd like to skip over the fellowship of his sufferings, please. Guess what? There's no resurrection without you dying first. 
If you want to know the power of his resurrection, you're going to have to be baptized into the fellowship of his sufferings. Just to get a taste of just, just that tiny amount of what Jesus suffered for you on the cross, to get just a taste in the sufferings that we have to endure, it causes such a deep appreciation for what he went through, for the depths of his love, for his unspeakable mercy. When you suffer with someone, that's when true intimacy is built. That is when loyalty and faithfulness is built. That's when commitment is proven. That's when you know this guy has my back and he's not leaving me alone. And it builds such strength of faith and conviction. Remember the story of Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, he says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there has given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep from exalting myself. The thorn in the flesh. We're not talking about just a little, you know, prick on the finger and a little drop of blood comes out. We're talking about... He, what he's describing here is something that hurts every time he moves. Every time he moves, he feels it. It's a pain that tormented him, he said. And he said, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. God, get me out of this. And what did God say? I'm going to take you through instead, Paul. My grace is sufficient. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. When you suffer with the Lord and you go through pain and tragedy with the Lord, there are certain rock-bottom convictions that are formed in your heart that no man can ever talk you out of. No experience can ever sway you. You're grounded upon the rock. I've seen life and death. I've seen heaven and hell through with my Lord, and he's always been there. Nobody can tell me he's not there for me. Nobody can convince me that he doesn't love me. Nobody can tell me that his power is not there for my be on my behalf. And you develop such rock-solid convictions by going through the sufferings of your Lord. He says, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses. Oh, there was a time when I prayed, God, get me out, God, get me out, God, get me out. But you know what? When I experience the grace of God, I don't really even notice the weaknesses anymore. I don't even notice the pain. Like Stephen, I don't even notice those rocks pounding my body because I'm so overwhelmed with his grace and his mercy. You know, you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, or you read some of the history books about uh, some of our forefathers and some of our uh, family from long ago being suffered and tortured to death for their faith. And how many times the witness came back that the grace of God was greater. The peace of God was stronger. They didn't die in agony. They died in peace because the grace of God just lifted their head up and above their enemies. Gave them a peace that was so far greater than the atrocity they were facing. He says, I'm well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses and persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am what? That's when I really experience. But see, you never know that strength without going through the weakness. You never know the strength and power of God without being persecuted and tortured and tormented and in agony and in struggle. There's only one way you be, get to know the grace of God in that way. And yes, the sufferings hurt. And yes, they're bad and it's not good and it's ugly and it hurts. And... But God does all of that to display and to show off in you, his power and his glory and how he's so much greater than the pain and the suffering of sin. I put there in your notes, seeking a quick fix many times forces impetuous actions. 
that can cause lifelong consequences. Look here at Psalms 37, verse 1. I think we'll probably end with this. A Psalm of David again, he said this, Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious towards wrongdoers. And sometimes we can get kind of antsy, right? God, there's so much. Why are you letting all this evil just take over the world, God? What, why are we surrounded by all these wicked people? He says, calm down. They will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. But God, what if I get hurt? What if they kill me? What if they come after me, Lord? Look at what he says in verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do what? Do good. Because many times, you know, we want to react and do to them before they do to us. I want the first punch, man. He says, no, that's not the way Christians operate. We trust in the Lord and we do good. We don't let their evil overcome us so that we respond in evil. We just do what Christians do and we do good. We dwell in the land and we cultivate faithfulness and even if I get hurt, even if the wicked overcome me, even if I get wounded and bleed and suffer in some way, I'm going to be faithful in doing good because that's what my father is, that's what Christians do, and I'm not going to let their evil overtake me and make me do something evil. I'm going to be faithful and do good. Why? Because I trust in the Lord. The Lord will sort this out. I don't have to try to prove myself or vindicate myself to these wicked people. I'm trusting God that he'll sort it out. He'll defend me. Then he goes on in verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You can't be trusted with the desires of your heart until you learn first how to delight yourself in the Lord. Because your fulfillment in life, your joy in life, has to come from the Lord. Your satisfaction in life has to come from the Lord. And we think, well, I'll never be satisfied until I get the desires of my heart. Well, then you can't be trusted with those desires because those desires will lead you away from God every time. Only when you come to the place of realizing my satisfaction, my fulfillment comes in God and God alone. And these other things would be nice to have, but I don't have to have them because I have the Lord. Only then you can be trusted with those desires. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and what? He will do it. How many times do we want to take matters into our own hands? That guy just cut me off. It ticked me off. Here, I'm going to go around, speed up, and cut him off. See there? How you like that? Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. He'll take care of that guy. Don't take matters into your own hands. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. God will sort it out in the end. The righteous will be justified. And then verse 7, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. And we've said it many times, waiting is one of the hardest things as Christians that we have to do. Wait for the Lord. Don't jump ahead of the Lord. Don't take matters into your own hands. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil doing. So see, when we're in the mode of, I'm going to seek the Lord because I want a quick fix, that's when many times we get impetuous and take matters into our own hands and try to force some action, force some type of correction. But if we rest in the Lord and wait for him, to deal with it and work it out. That's when we're truly seeking his heart and his mind. And Father, I'll find my peace in you. And as I find my peace in you, I have the rest and the grace that I need to wait patiently for you to take care of this. I don't don't need to jump ahead and take matters back into my own hands. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will what? Wait for the Lord. And you know, many times when you're waiting for the Lord, the Lord will direct you to do something. But until he directs you to do something, just continue to wait. Don't move by your own ambition. Don't move from your own initiative. Don't move uh, from your own strength in the matter. When he speaks and he wants you to do something, you'll know it. 
But don't jump ahead of God. Just wait for the Lord to move and to instruct. You know, I, I put in there the, the whole thing about Abraham and Abraham. Sarah and Abraham, that, you know, they waited 25 years for Isaac to be born. So let's give them credit for that. But about halfway through, yeah, somewhere about halfway through, because Ishmael was born when Abraham was 86, and then Isaac was born when Abraham was 100. So uh, almost halfway through, they jumped ahead of God, and Sarah gives Abraham Hagar, and Hagar bears Abraham Ishmael, right? And so they, were doing, they did exactly what we're saying not to do. They got antsy. They started to fret. We've got to take some action. We've got to do something. They took it back into their own hands, resorted to worldly human methods and strategy. They get this Ishmael. Look at what this says about Ishmael, chapter 16. The angel of the Lord said to her, to Hagar further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael. Look at verse 12. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. Sounds like the Middle East. Does it sound like what we're experiencing now in the Middle East, of them being against everyone and everyone's hand being against them, and they call such fight and violence and wars? I put there just for some historical background, you know, Muslims believe that Ishmael was the heir of Abraham, not Isaac. And while it's true that Ishmael was the firstborn, who did God say was the child of promise? Isaac. And so, but the Muslims believe that Ishmael was the rightful heir. Muhammad, their prophet, they believe was a descendant of Ishmael. And he was the one who had all of the revelations of the Quran. He, you know, he received them, wrote them down, and then further elaborated on them. So, it, you know, and we can't get upset with Abraham and say, when I get to heaven, I got a thing or two to discuss with Abraham. Why, what were you thinking? It's a thing of, if it wasn't Abraham, this evil would have come some other way because sin had taken over the world at this point. But can you see, I just use that example of Abraham, the lasting effects, the consequences, the scars that Abraham had to bear because he jumped ahead of God. Now Abraham is the father of our faith and we learn great principles of faith from him. And some of our heroes of the faith, they, they got to be heroes because of the things they learned in their failures. And we learn a lot from our failures too. But just realize the importance of waiting on God and letting him act instead of taking matters into our own hands. If you take matters into your own hands, then like Abraham and Ishmael, you can set consequences in motion that last for generations. Wait for God. Rest in him. He'll do it in his way, in his perfect way, in his perfect timing. And then lastly, just as the last note in, in your notes, I, I put there seeking a quick fix instead of seeking God first is self-serving and it many times leads one to abandon their faith. Because remember the parable of Jesus about the seed being sown on different soils? And he says of the one type of uh, soil, Mark 14, verse 17, those that are sown on stony ground when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are what? They are offended. What does that tell you? They weren't seeking God for God. They were seeking God for a quick fix. And when the quick fix didn't come, they were offended and turned away from the Lord. So that's why it's so important when you and I are going through trials and difficulties to seek God for who he is. Fall in love with him. Let his presence be your grace and your protection and your fortress and the refuge where you run to. And don't just seek God for the quick fix. 
Make your requests known, but also be willing to abide in the presence of his Holy Spirit to abide in that refuge if he decides to take you through instead of taking you out. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us. You demonstrate your mercy towards us so much every day. Father, we thank you for the times of great victory and exhilaration when we pray and we get an answer right away and the sickness leaves or the pain leaves or the dead are raised or we thank you for those times. We look for and pray for and expect those times. But then, Father, we also have to deal with the times when you take us through instead of taking us out. And the comfort, when we walk through that valley of the shadow of death, our comfort is, you are with me. And when I walk down that dark valley and I cling so closely to you, it causes such a relationship to be established. And that relationship is better than gold. It's better than all of the worldly peace. It's better than any thrill or joy this earth has to offer. Father, I'm, I'm, I end up being thankful for the valley, for the preciousness of the relationship that developed with you. Father, teach us how to find our peace and our refuge, not in drugs, not in alcohol, not in the vain amusements of this world. Teach us how to be satisfied with you. Don't let us be like the Israelites who grumbled and complained about having to eat manna day after day after day. Father, change our appetite so that we delight in living off of the supernatural. Change our appetite so that we become repulsed by the attractions of this world because they distract us from you. Give us an appetite for you and you alone. And thank you for the trials that you bring into our life that drive us to you. Father, we give you praise and we thank you for this day that we can give to you to take a Sabbath rest, to cause other things to stop so we can just meditate and pray and think on you. We ask that you bring us back tonight to seek your face in worship and in prayer. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.